trust is something completely else now. Like trust for me on a deeper level is the ability to live with uncertainty and to live with fear. Because only then do I actually have to trust. If I know what's going to happen, I don't need to trust. I just know. Doesn't it sound tempting to have complete trust in a relationship, even if you're sometimes jealous? The partner can feel free. But where does this freedom stop? And what is allowed to be called trust or even fidelity? Does fidelity ultimately mean monogamy? Today, I'm talking to Rafael Spanocchi, a man in his mid-40s who has consciously ventured into open marriage, a step with an open and uncertain end, which is even desirable. This podcast brings you stories from and about people who stepped into the unknown, stories about fear, uncertainty, the illusion of security, or I don't know, let's see what it will be about. My name is Katarina Bayer and I will host you on this journey into the unknown. two weeks ago in your ring and the one of your wife two ships are engraved can you tell me why you chose this symbol of two ships it originated uh, at a um, workshop actually it was a workshop for singles it was a workshop to teach singles to attract mates better but somehow they allowed us to go there as a couple and uh, very much in the beginning one of the of the moderators told us that in a relationship you are both sitting in the same boat and I said stop um, that's, I don't like this, this picture because for me it conveys something that's very tight it's very unpleasant like you can almost imagine you're sitting in this sailboat and you want to sail left and the other person doesn't really know what you're doing and then kind of grabs the wrong rope or uh, stuff and so I said I imagine two people in a relationship being in separate boats but deciding to sail in the same direction. And this image somehow stuck and for me is still very much a, um, a guiding post for, for, for my relationship that we are two separate people and as long as we decide to go together we, are, um, in, we will continue this relationship as it is but At some point, we may decide to branch out and somebody can leave for a certain time and come back. Or It's, it's, not, it's unknown. We don't know. We can decide at any time. And, and how much did you beforehand talk to your now wife about... Because, as I understood, you said it was your image. So the question is, when did you discuss it with her? And was it okay for her from the beginning on that this is the image that you have? We, we talked ab about the way we wanted to relate before. So it wasn't like a complete surprise, but I think that this image, she was in the same workshop as I was, so I think she might have heard it first when we were there. Oh, I'm pretty sure, because I never thought about this boat thing before. But she agreed totally, because we talked before about it and we talked a lot about um, relationships and monogamy in, in as, a, as actually a very specific form of relationship, because somehow there's a... Did this always get mixed up? Like when you talk about a relationship here, you mean a monogamous re relationship. And I think this is not true. Like not all relationships are monogamous and not all people are monogamous, but it's on a, like a, a shades of gray. So you have strictly monogamous people and totally polygamous people and everything in between. And naturally human beings fall somewhere along this line, but very few fall into the extremes if they're honest with themselves. So that's what we talked about. And I think this discussion kind of tied into this picture and made it, made it seem not that surprising at that point in time. 
Nowadays, I, I hear and read a lot that, you know, it's um, impossible that you spend the rest of your life, like 50 or 60 years with, with somebody else. What is your belief? Do you think that you and your wife can stay together forever? I don't know. I have no beliefs in that direction. We will see. So it's also not important for you that you know, like, this marriage continues for the next years? Have you, like... Why did you choose to marry then? Well, two things really. I think there, there's a, the, the problem is that there's a lot of, of lack of differentiation in this subject. And one thing is, what is marriage, right? And so marriage is two things. And one thing is a purely formal and bureaucratic thing. It's something that means a certain set of things to the government to the tax authority, to uh, your life insurance, to um, your bank. That's one thing. And the other thing is what it means to you and your wife, or to me and my wife, or to you and your husband. Um, and these two very often get mixed up. And so we kind of differentiated those two. And we got married in front of the law, because we wanted to have the advantages that that brings. And there are quite a few advantages, especially in Germany. So it absolutely makes sense that if you're together for some time to marry, from a purely practical point of view. On the other hand, we talk to each other, what does it mean for us? And for me and for Johanna, it means deciding to give our best and try to maintain this connection with each other, to, to talk about where are our boats heading, where do we want them to head, to set course in a kind of dialogue between autonomous human beings who do not have, because that's exactly why this becomes interesting. No? If we both sit in the same boat, and I'm like a dictator guy, for instance, then I say, onwards. To the white whale, no, and the other goes, Oh, but I'm scared. And it's like, okay, yeah, you have to come along. And I, I don't know, I, that's not nice. I think it's, it's, there's a lot of force involved, a lot of coercion. And for me, if the other is in the same boat and I start sailing, the other might say, Oh, where's he going? Do I want to follow? Maybe not. So I have to go and say, Hey, I want to go to this island and it's really beautiful and there are palm trees and coconuts and we can relax on the beach and have a great time. Do you want to come along? You know, But the, I will have to make it attractive somehow for the other person to come along. Otherwise, So making it attractive to always keep it alive and keep it interesting for both pa partners. I don't have all the answers there, but I think that's definitely needed and there are different approaches to how you keep things attractive some things might be attractive on an emotional level other things might be attractive on an other level practical level financial level social level so a human relationship is very multi-layered thing that's happening all at once and um, so it can be a number of things that keep a, a relationship interesting what did your let's say, closest friends or parents in your, your close family, how did they react that, that you really live this and now you're getting married and still live in an open way together? The reaction is very different. Like for, for my parents, that's very hard to understand. And I had a lot of discussions with, especially my father, who was totally foreign to that concept. And um, found that actually, like, I'm not allowed to even do that because marriage is like a contract and there's a certain number of aspects of the contract that are kind of governed by society and they exclude this kind of openness which I think if you read what a marriage is by law, that's actually not true In what you cannot do by law is marry another person that's polygamy and it's clearly outlawed in Austria and in Germany as well and I think in Almost all Western countries, polygamy is strictly forbidden. But um, the laws actually do not govern who you sleep with, and nor should they. I mean, that's clearly beyond the, the, um, 
the scope of what of what the law, uh, of what the legislation should be concerned with or not. For friends, usually the, there's two kind of trajectories that I see happen. One is I talk to people and they say, no, 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 that's not possible. And then I talk to them for a while and they say, yeah, I see what you mean. It sounds very good, but I could I could never do that. It's always the same. I could never do that. Okay. And the others go like, yeah, that's cool. I'm doing the same or I see what you mean. And actually when you talk to people, you find that quite a few do have more leeway in their relationships than than I think was usual for our parents' generation. And I think one of the reasons is that a lot of people saw monogamy fail with their parents and then it was some big secret that lurked in the background and then came out and it was horrible and the world ended and wow, and people often then divorced because somebody slept with somebody else once or twice. I mean, if you think about it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Huh? I was I was asking myself a question a lot and I haven't found an answer, so I, I thought I'd ask you. <laughs> um, do you think their partners stay together because they already know each other and they're just afraid that if they would split up that they will never find somebody else? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a big one. And I think there's there's a correlation because in a way... Like what I always wondered is I had a few um, or still have a few homosexual friends, gay friends especially. And most of those relationships that I know from, from, from them were very short. I don't know. I, I'm sure, like I know a couple that are married, but most of them are like in a constant flux of partners. And um, they always dressed sharply, were fit, very funny and outgoing. And uh, a lot of the couples I knew like got more and more fat, ugly and boring with time. And that's like, there must be some kind of... <laughs> pattern. <laughs> pattern <laughs> happening here. Something's happening here. And what I figured out is that if you know, like if I know that we're together forever, forever, you've just promised me, you know, wild, wild unto God, unto the Holy Bible, that you will stay with me come rain or shine. Then basically, we get lazy or? I'll get lazy. I'll just like, yeah, she'll, she'll be there. I don't care. I can get fat and not dress well and not be super nice and not be funny. But yeah, everything's okay. And, you know, it goes slowly. It's over time. Uh, just get a little more lazy every year and every year and every year. And, uh, so you're saying you just ha are in an open relationship because you know you would get lazy and this would be disrespectful to your wife? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons, definitely. Yeah. And, and do you know couples who are married and live a monogamous relationship and you think that actually they live it in a way that... Is, is like the way that you are living, but they are monogamous? Do you know people like that? Not explicitly. I know a couple of relationships that I think are monogamous, that I think are really great. I, I know a few. I, also couples with kids married for a long time. But I'm not 1000% sure that they are monogamous. And in these relationships that I know that I really like and admire, there is lots of space where... There is no expected implicit consent of the other. Like the person actually goes there and says, here I am, where are you? And this, I think, the, the more often this happens, the better. But this is this invitation, do you want to sail with me tonight on my boat? You're talking about a big thing like trust, freedom and space here. And before we come to this, there is a quote that I would like to share you from Marcel Proust. It's, The voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And the thing is that I think that some people are like hunting people. They are always seeking for something new. But for me, the concept was always, I have to seek for others to get new. And what you are describing is more, I can also see my partner every time with new eyes. And this is also seeking for, for new But you still have the option that there's other things you can try out. I love the quote, by the way. It's very beautiful. Um, and there's two parts to this, to this question for me. The one part is, is this kind of hunting versus discovering part. 
the other part is about like how how does this affect the relationship and um i think neither me nor my wife actually go out that much and hunt for other people but nevertheless and i think this is the case in most relationships most open relationships or actually i don't know no i don't know let, let me rephrase i think one of the big fears that come up when people want to open up a relationship is that then the partner will go out and basically screw whatever's available you know like be with somebody else every night and you know just really but i think that's very uh, that's rare. seldom like it doesn't yeah totally i mean it takes a lot of work It's really hard work to do that. You have you have to be the type. Then basically, you you probably know your partner. Uh, so is he the type before? Was he a type that basically slept with somebody else every night? If not, why all of a sudden, when he has a safe haven to return to, should he do it? You know, it's, it's very unlikely. I mean, I'm sure you will always find this one case where this happens, and then it's like, see, I told you. But I think like 95. 99% of all the cases are not, that's not the case. People will just from time to time meet somebody by chance that they find interesting where there's a mutual attraction and they want to pursue that attraction. And what happens, and I think this is the part that ties in with this seeing with new eyes is it keeps alive something in them, something juicy, something, you know, open, something... That's about pleasure, it's about lust, it's about a certain kind of sexual drive, and it keeps it alive. But you can also be a critic and say it's a certain kind of fear that you lose the other one, and this is why you keep it alive. Maybe so, and, uh, and actually that's what, what happened with us, that, that a few times, and it weren't really so many times, but like... It, it introduced a lot of, of fear and uncertainty in the relationship. Like I was like, ooh, ah. But I, I don't know, it was always very revived, like, like um, choosing things up a lot. So what is then jealousy for you? Is there anything like jealousy? Like what would be a thing that your wife wouldn't be allowed? Like we, we talked about it and I'm still not sure. I'm not saying it's not allowed, but I, I think it would be quite a tall order is to actually, when she would like have an actual second relationship, like say there's this guy that she meets and they spend a night together and then she says like, ah, Raphael, here's John and I'm going to go on a vacation for a week with him. Hmm. So it would be like this John would have the equal position like you. Yeah, or I would know in advance that now they're going to spend a wonderful week together in and a nice Sitting at home and thinking what they are doing. Uh, uh, This would not be okay. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not saying it's forbidden, but I think it would be quite hard to stomach for me. Like, like you know, this kind of thing that then happens in the head. That they're like, oh my God, yeah. And I'm sure he's so great. And like, he's making love to her like she never knew before. <laughs> you know, these things. But it's interesting because the only thing we're doing is with these thoughts that makes us insecure is that we think we are not good enough. The other one is better. Mm -hmm. What do they get? Like this, why, why is insecurity always coming with the thought, I am not good enough? Because that's the nature of insecurity. Otherwise, if you knew you were good enough, how would you be insecure? You would probably feel something else. Pain, for instance, or sadness. But you wouldn't feel... I mean, you know, if you knew that you were good enough and like the other couldn't possibly take away what you have with this person, how could you be insecure? You would be totally secure. But for me, one other aspect of um, insecurity is this, that you feel far more alive. Because in this moment, you have to make decisions. Like what we, what we see nowadays when people are not sure when they can travel, if somebody else is infected and all these things, that make you in a way far more insecure because you don't know how long this is going to take. But in a way, the people I spoke to, they are far more reflected on their on their present, what they what is what values they have, what they want to do. 
as I never had these interesting conversations with them before. Mm -hmm. So I think there's also this side that I think is a quite a yeah quite a benefit of insecurity. Yeah, that that's what I mean. Like I'm I'm not sure being this insecure with uh, with my wife would necessar necessarily be a bad thing. Mm. It would be quite intense, I think. But this intensity also offers a lot of benefit. And I think what monogamy tries uh, tries to do now, it has a totally different historical background. What it tries to do now is basically just reduce the level of um, of insecurity in a relationship. And in a way... It's understandable because then you feel safe and you can open up a trust. But in a way, this trust is meaningless because if if I know something for certain, where's the trust? It's just it's just knowing, and it's a very kind of childish, blind kind of trust. And I think as adults, trust means something else. It means actually living with a certain amount of intensity and mm -hmm. uncertainty and kind of. Oh, I don't know if it will succeed, but I'm doing it anyway, you know. And this is exactly, and even if you just say it, if I just say it, I already feel this kind of like energy and some tingling in my fingers, and I just feel more alive, you know. I'm just like, yeah. Hmm. And the other, if I just know, it, like if I say, yeah, I'm gonna go down and get a pack of cigarettes. How exciting is that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, because you now came uh, the second time to this big um, word of trust, you know what I did? I wanted to have a definition of trust because for me, I know for myself what trust is, but I wasn't sure what the definition is. Mm -hmm. So I found a definition of a guy whose name is Stephen Robbins, and he's actually a world best-selling author on management and organizational behavior. So he sounds quite smart. <laughs> um, he says, trust is the positive expectation that someone else will not behave opportunistically in words, deeds or decisions. Trust is an experiential process in which one person assumes that the basis of past experience that the other person will in principle act in accordance with his or her previous behavior in the future. Non-opportunistic refers to the risk that is incumbent on every relationship of trust. And in short words, it's like the past experience that you had with a person or the past behavior, you just reflect on the future and you, you're sure that the other person will do the same. And this is why you trust the other person. Mm -hmm. And when I read this definition, I was like, okay, But how fully present can I be if I always live in the past and think that past behavior is reflecting on the future? Exactly. Like that, I thought the same thing. But I think, again, like this guy comes from a business perspective. And then in a way, I understand what he means. For, for instance, let's say we decide to do, a, I don't know, financial transaction. Like I sell something to you. And you give me, and, I want, and I'm saying, hey, Katharina, I'm going to deliver the goods tomorrow. Give me the money today. You know, do you do it or do, do you not do it? So there's some kind of thinking like, hmm, maybe we did business together before. And, and it then, went well, so we can do it again. Exactly. Yeah. And this is just, for me, this is a, a, um, a heuristic, so like a rule of thumb. That's mm. like, and that there's a place for that, totally. Regarding human relationships and especially intimate relationship, it's totally useless for me because trust is something completely else now. Like trust for me on a deeper level is the ability to live with uncertainty and to live with fear. Because only then do I actually have to trust. If I know what's going to happen, I don't need to trust. I just know. You know, I open the fridge and I trust the fridge door to open. Yes, it opened a million times and unless it's not broken, it will open again. Of course, I trust it because I cannot be certain. There's always this one time when it breaks, right? But for me, this is absolutely meaningless. Not in a business context, again. This is something absolutely valuable. But in the context of relationships, it's very different and I think um, this definition doesn't offer, doesn't offer anything. Because then I would actually expect my wife to behave the same. 
all what the time. makes it unexciting? No, I, I really like that you said, because there is fear and uncertainty, this is why I have to trust. Can we go back once more to your wedding? You know, I'm, I'm in this age, middle of the 30s, where you're invited to so many weddings and stuff. And usually you get an invitation a year before. They sometimes tell you even what you have to wear or, you know. So you married during Corona. So two weeks ago, or let's say after the first wave of Corona. And I remember that you told me that until some days before the marriage, you weren't even sure how many people are allowed, how the ceremony can happen and what requirements. What did this change on your wedding day for you that there were so many things that were so unsure? It was, in a way, it made it very wonderful, I have to say, because like... We really didn't know how many people could come. And then, like, about a week before, or two weeks before, it was clear that everybody was basically, should be allowed to travel. Except my brother who came from the UK. And this was a whole different story that actually only resolved 10 hours before our wedding or so. Keeps it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and then we knew everybody could come, but... I had inside my family, I had people who had for the whole quarantine basically stayed at home and only went out to take walks where nobody else was. On the one extreme and on the other peop extreme people who got um, certificates from their doctor that they are not allowed to wear masks, to not wear masks in public. And who thought this whole corona thing is a hoax. Mm. So I thought when these people get together... On your wedding. <laughs> On my wedding. How is it going to be? Will it be nice? Will they get along? Like if somebody comes with a mask, will it be accepted or not? Mm. Will people only talk about Corona all the time? And um, weddings are always, I think, very emotional in a lot of ways, and especially for the parents. And the, re the reaction of both my parents and the parents of my wife were <laughs> shocking. <laughs> Actually, like we were, they were so off that we thought, like, where does this come from? This is totally strange. Yeah? And I don't, I'm still not sure. Maybe it has something to do with a wedding being something where you actually let go of your child and it done has its own family. Maybe I don't, it's just a thought. But then at the day, everybody got together and actually everybody got along really well and was relaxed and had a great time. And I was just so thankful for that after more than a month of constantly checking and asking and talking to and not knowing that it all came together and came together well and in a beautiful way that was, uh, was very moving for me, really. It was super, I was, I'm still so thankful for everybody to just show up. Was there one reason why it was so moving? Because you didn't actually expect a lot? Yeah. Because yes. on some weddings I've been, I, I had the feeling there was so much expectation, even on the guests, yeah. that in the end something failed. And what you are describing is you, you didn't know what happened, you weren't really sure about things, and you just got, went with the flow, and this is what moved you. Totally. Like we had very low expectations of the wedding. We just hoped that nobody would fight about something like mask or if the whole thing was uh, brought by some evil mastermind or actually a disease or something like that. Um, and as soon as the people were there and they were actually getting along, we were just so happy because this for us was the most important thing. Like it really didn't matter if like the food was amazing or everybody had a perfect place to sit or all these things that are usually more important at the wedding. And so in a way, I'm very thankful for all of this circumstance that it created something that was very special. But some critical question that popped up into my head. Um, I wouldn't say it's my critical question. Maybe I just read it. Um, when... When I first came up with this concept of open relationships and having more partners, 
I first had the thought like, yeah, because you don't want to commit to one person. Like it's so hard to commit to one person and you're just running away from every fight or you just, you know what I mean? So I was wondering, have you ever been that way? Like, have you ever had the desire to have this respectful two ships next to each other and you can choose on which ship you, you spend your time for some time and then go back on your ships? Or is it a concept that you just, I don't know, I found out recently that it's yours? Um. So, so regarding the question of evasion, I mean, I think that's a constant pull. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I think it happens for a lot of people that you kind of pull away from difficult difficulty. Like you want to have an easy time, no? You want to have a good time. Everybody wants to have a good time. So how do you avoid that you then not flee into other relationships, for instance? And uh, that's a good question. But the question is still the same in a committed monogamous relationships because there are so many ways of evasion and I've seen strictly monogamous relationships 20, 30 years long where there was so much unsaid, so much unworked out that had just been carefully avoided for 10 years 12 years, 15 years so I think this is not a problem that's unique to, to open relationships and even more I would think that certain open relationships like we have where I basically I have to tell my wife that I um, spend the night with another person, mean that I already have this kind of difficult dialogue from time to time. It happens. Mm -hmm. And so actually I'm more used to it. And also this picture with the two boats, I have to ask my wife, hey, does your boat want to sail along with mine or not? So these kind of difficult conversations happen often. And it makes it more likely for me to have this conversation than in a committed monogamous relationships where everybody knows what's expected of them, will fulfill these expectations to the best of his uh, knowledge or ability and um, not so much has to be talked about, uh, which is, I think, one of the big appeals for these kind of relationships. Yeah, we don't have to talk about all this stuff. You know, it's very simple. That's the big appeal. And in a way, I understand, but I think... It's like living in a really small apartment that you get from the government. It's cheap, it's nice, uh, and it's very well, like you, every room has single access. Or you want to live in this wild house that has a lot of rooms, and in some rooms you don't know where, what's in there, mm. and, you know. And maybe there is a dead dog lying somewhere, and then you're like, well, shit, well, how did it get here? But, I mean, you know, you can choose. And I'm not saying... Everybody has to live in the big house. I prefer. And since when do you prefer? Like when you were describing now and, and telling me, it was really like I saw you 10 years ago. Like you you uh, immediately got younger. So I imagine yeah. this is not a recent thing that just since five years you're into this um, big house. No, I always wanted a lot of space in relationships. And I wasn't really sure how to get it actually. And only after some relationships that, that didn't go well or that, that ended, I, I figured, like, what am I doing wrong? You know, like, what, what's really, what's, what isn't working for me? And I think for me, this, it's just about having more freedom, more space in the relationship. And I, I think there's a couple of ways to achieve that. But for me, it just, I don't know, it just clicked at some point. And also, I have to say that when I got together with my wife, I lived in a house where I still live, but with a person who was a very active promoter, promoter of, of polygamy. Like he was definitely into it. Good uh, marketing person, huh? <laughs> excellent marketer. Very convincing. And he was just like talking on and on about this. And at the same time, I was also thinking about it. So it was like also at the right time. Like I was really open. So Johanna is the first one you have this open relationship with. Yeah. And and yeah. is are you the first one for her as well? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Coming back to this journey of new landscapes. Yeah. But you said something before, and we we come a bit away from this topic of monogamy now. But you said something that sometimes people they are afraid to tell the other one what they think or are afraid of conflict. I was wondering. I had the privilege 
that almost nobody close of me ever died. Like, okay, I lost grandparents, but they were most mainly 90. I was wondering if there is a person out there you would have liked um, now to rewind because there was something you wanted to say that to the person and it's not nice for you knowing that you can have never the chance that you can say this to this person. No, nobody died. Nobody died that I know um, why this, this was the case. But I think, thinking back about, like, especially my first relationship, but I mean, of course, it was like my first relationship. I totally, I totally failed there, like totally on almost every regard. Like that was actually a very nice person. And I was just really stupid and selfish and also not, I was, I was also blind. Like I really didn't see that person at all. And um, I have a daughter who's 13 now and um, in the relationship with her mother, like I also, it was basically the same thing. And it, it took me a long time to, to kind of see that, but I, like, I didn't really see the other person as another person you know, as, as what they are, as some, somebody with certain needs and preferences and so on, and that I kind of have to arrange myself with. Like, maybe I then, if I see it, I say like, okay, mm, this is going to be super tough, so maybe it's not worth it, but to just see it, you know, not like, ah, oh, yeah, there's this other person in the relationship and I have to make a relationship work, blah, 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 blah. but like, Ah, oh, there's this other person. The other person wants X, Y, Z. I want A, B, C. Okay. Hmm. You know? And this didn't happen. And I think that that caused a lot of pain for both of us. And it was a lot of it was my fault. Were you ever thinking about returning back to her and talk about it? To, to return to the relationship, no. No, not returning. I mean, returning back, meaning... Um, sitting down together and, and, and reflect after so many years? Not until this point, no, actually. I think basically the relationship that we now have is in a way a lot better than the one that we had when we were still a couple. Um, but we actually never really talked about what went wrong. Well, good point. Might be interesting. When I was preparing for this interview, I was thinking about... Do I really know you? Like we met two years ago, we've been for several walks, we had what I think very deep conversations, very honest, that what you said before, I felt like you see me and I, I can see you, that you're showing yourself. And then I was wondering, but what do I actually know about you? Like, okay, I met your wife, but I don't know your family. And when can I say I know this person? Do I have to be in kindergarten with the person? Or is it that I'm also proud because I know this person and this person is famous? famous. And so I was wondering, when do you think you can say I know you to somebody? I have a story here. Um Yeah, like I said, my daughter uh, just turned 13 a couple of months ago and now she's a, a teenager and uh, she has um, an Instagram channel, for instance, or like an Instagram presence. No? And I kind of watched her feed and I said to myself, I have no idea where this comes from, <laughs> you know, so after changing the diapers of a person and spending all her life with me in a way, seeing her a lot. I don't know who she is. Like she's becoming somebody that I do not know. And this is, I think, I think it's very sad in a way, but also wonderful because she's an, her own person and she's gonna go out into the world and yeah. Is it also the fear that you cannot protect her or or that you always had an image of your daughter that is maybe not what she is? Yeah, I think it has to do with, with protection and with... Security. Security also of, of our relationship because I think that changes. Well, like when a child is really small, it depends on you. And children are also super loving. Like they, 
they really love the person that, that takes care of them, uh, even in horrible situations. No, you mm -hmm. know this kind of thing with child abuse. So mm -hmm. a child gets abused for years by her father, but still loves him to death, and you know, it's hor like horrible. But this changes. At some point, she becomes like her own boat, and she can choose to, you know, sail away. Yeah, that's very scary. hopefully not too far. Uh, When we're talking now about 13, do you remember what you wanted to be when when you grow up? Like, remember Rafael is 13 and now doesn't have an Instagram account because <laughs> back then I'm happy that we didn't have Instagram. But do you remember what you wanted to be? There were different phases. Um, one was an astronaut. I wanted to be an astronaut for a really long time. Wow. I think I just wanted to be alone. <laughs> 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 freedom. This is freedom in space. Really space. And the other thing was I wanted to be, um, yeah, you know, in, in, in English he's called Gyro Gearloose. In, in German he's called Daniel Düsentrieb. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to be this guy, you know, this inventor who kind of had these great ideas about yeah. stuff. And then, you know, so this is what I wanted to be. And I always tried to come up with some nice contraption, like, make a new coffee machine or stuff like that. How, how, funny is, how funny is it? Because I I googled you, because for me this is how you find out something about somebody. So I went onto your LinkedIn profile, and your LinkedIn profile said for a certain moment, I, I don't remember for how many years now, but it says, I'm an instigator, innovator, procrastinator, Doer, quitter, and fighter. Yeah. <laughs> so you still want to be this Daniel Dusendrip? In a way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But one more funny thing that I found when I Googled you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I found something on Instagram. And it was from 2013. And it's a picture of a horoscope for dogs. And, yeah. um, I, and I was wondering, you know, when when we go about fate and destiny, like, do you think there is such thing like fate and destiny and that some of the main parts of the road are already there when we come to this planet? I think we cannot know. Uh, if, if it is, and there are people who think it is, no? And think that, that basically it's like there is very little choice, but that's not how it appears to you. Like your individual experience is very different from that. Like you, you, you feel you have choice. You feel you have agency. You feel that your choices make a difference. And so I think the question is basically philosophically, and it's an interesting question. You can debate it, but it doesn't really change the, the experience that you have of life as it unfolds. And as it unfolds, it presents a certain kind of in uncertainty and um, incompleteness of information. So you constantly feel that you have to make decisions while not knowing everything that's needed to actually make a very informed decision. And sometimes you know a bit more and then you feel more comfortable and sometimes you know a bit less. And then you feel greater levels of, of uncertainty. And so for me... I don't know, I'm, I'm not a big philosopher, I have to say. I think basically if, you, if you're really honest with yourself, the only thing that you can really say are true are things that are, um, you know, tautology. So you can say, say things like, I am because I am. That's a clear truth. Or the future is unknown. So another clear truth. Or the past is gone. These things are true. But when it gets more complicated, it's always up for debate. And I used always used to say that uh, that the mind is a bitch because <laughs> it'll go with whoever pays, <laughs> pays it up. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess then I don't have to ask you the question. If you could pick, what would you choose? Wisdom or happiness? Mm, happiness, of course, but... No, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, what, what, what's, what does wisdom mean for you? What does wisdom mean? Mm -hmm. uh, like a bigger amount of knowledge that actually prepares you for a lot of situation that you would have been afraid of? 
and mm-hmm. that you guide yourself and others because of things that, that you reflected on and a man in a, with a long white beard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure because happiness is also very hard kind of to, to grasp, no? What is happiness? Can you have it in a way? Can you have happiness? Like, would you want to be happy all the time? Or And how much of it? How much of it? And like, in a way, aren't you happy all the time? Like, if you accept, you know, these kind of things. So maybe I would rephrase the question and, and say, do I want to have experience or acceptance in a way, you know? then I'd rather have acceptance, the, the ability to accept what is as what it is. For instance, if there's sadness, to accept that there's sadness. If um, I'm angry, to accept that there's anger. If uh, there's great joy, to accept that there's great joy and not really you know, make a big story out of it, but just experience is that it's something that's that's kind of constantly moving in a su- such a way. You know? And then experience in a way is great, but also can be blinding and terrible like you say ah, I've, so I've seen all of this thousands of times it usually ends like this I will end with three questions the first one is what is your biggest fear at the moment strangely my biggest fear is to go hungry and I don't know where it comes from but there it is to not be able to provide for myself is it just the fear of providing for yourself or also now for your wife? Yeah, true. No, for my wife and for my kid. You ever had any issues with starving? No, of course not, living in Austria. But I had, a, like, a, it was probably a month or two where, where I was really broke. And I can still remember that I went into the supermarket and I, I, I got one of these little bread rolls that I paid And the cheese I stole. How long ago is that? 20 years. Uh, that wasn't nice. But I really I could, I couldn't afford a breakfast. What are you currently doing that you yet don't know how it will turn out? My wife and I started an enterprise together. On an e-commerce startup that will focus on selling products of small producers of food non-perishable food and yeah we just started and there's a ton of unknown at the moment but you're sitting in this boat together in this boat we're sitting together yeah. all the time yeah. <laughs> the the last oh. the last question i have is not really a question years ago i started to write in this book that you see now and i wrote wrote down quotes that really meant something for me at a certain time of this year. And um, I will just go through the pages and you will say, say stop at a certain stop. Okay. <laughs> and I will just, we just pick one quote and you will just comment on it, whatever just pops up in your head. Okay. Okay. So let's start. Stop. Do you want to go left or right? Left, please. And do you want to go uh, on the top, on the bottom or in the middle? Bottom. This quote is from Buddha. Holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else. You are the one who gets burned. Very wise, obviously. <laughs> Buddha, can't mess with Buddha. So you know what wisdom, uh, no, you know now what wisdom is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, but so I couldn't agree more, right? So thank you very much. It was really a pleasure. Pleasure was all mine. If you like this podcast, please follow me on Facebook at Podcast Into The Unknown or on Instagram into underscore the underscore unknown underscore podcast. You can listen to this podcast on www.intotheunknown.at, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And if you have an idea for an interview partner, or just want to leave me some feedback, please don't hesitate to contact me on Instagram, or send me an email on office at intotheunknown.at. If you are interested in this particular episode, 
You might also want to listen to my interview with the sex journalist Teresa Lachner on lust, the joy of bourgeoisie and why the unknown doesn't always need to be exciting.